Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Jeremy Venstra Vanderweil will present Pathways to New Treatments in Autism Spectrum Disorder. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $394 million to fund more than 5,700 grants to more than 4,700 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jeremy Venstra Vanderweil. He is Division Director of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University. He is a member of our Scientific Council and was a 2010 Young Investigator grantee. Today's webinar will begin with his presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will ask your questions and will address as many of them as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Venstra Vanderwill. Jeremy, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I really appreciate the kind introduction um, and also appreciate uh, the invitation from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Uh, like many in our field, um, I've been fortunate to have uh, support from the BBRF um, and also am fortunate uh, to see the BBRF uh, supporting those um, in my division and across uh, our department and, and really throughout the field, uh, helping people to launch their research careers. Um, so uh, I have uh, 45 minutes or so, and in that time, I can't possibly cover in detail uh, everything that we know in autism spectrum disorder or even uh, what we are working on in terms of potential treatments. And so what I'm going to do instead is to take a conceptual approach to talk about um, the pathways that uh, can carry us forward to new treatments um, after offering a brief overview about what we know currently. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, both uh, sources of funding um, and also note, um, and I'll highlight this when it pops up in the uh, presentation, um, that the latter stages of uh, drug development um, usually require some investment at the level of uh, an industry partner, um, and we have had some funding from industry that I'll highlight when that becomes relevant. Um, and then I'd also like to note that um, in this time frame, it isn't possible to call out everyone who's been uh, engaged in this work. These are some of the folks um, in my research group, um, but I'm really uh, offering a conceptual overview and we'll have at the bottom of the slide uh, either a paper um, or some uh, individual who is engaged uh, in generating the data. Um, so briefly, I'm going to discuss uh, the challenge of heterogeneity in autism, talk about what we know currently and, and how we know that, uh, and then really spend most of the time talking about pathways to new treatments, um, including both a molecular approach based on genetic findings, as well as an approach that is more uh, traditional in, in psychiatry, at least, uh, thinking about treatments that address particular symptoms. Uh, and then I'm going to circle back to the idea that um, because autism is not simply one thing, um, we are going to need to guide our treatments based on biology, based on biomarkers. And finally, uh, discuss um, what is the eventual hope that we will have medical treatments that can be linked with behavioral treatments such that a medicine or another intervention may put the brain in a position where it's better able to learn, um, but then we will still have to teach. 
So when we think about autism spectrum disorder, we're not talking about a disease like tuberculosis. Um, instead, we're talking about a final common outcome of quite a number of different uh, ways for uh, brain development to go awry. Um, when we think about the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, you can see those in the center, uh, social impairment and restricted and repetitive behavior, and those must be present in order to achieve a diagnosis. But as a clinician, I almost never see somebody who only has autism spectrum disorder. Instead, I see a constellation of other things uh, coming along for the ride, and that can include cognitive comorbidities, behavioral comorbidities, which is often the reason somebody is coming to see me as a psychiatrist, medical comorbidities, and then these days, uh, people are oftentimes either walking in or walking out with a genetic diagnosis. Those are actually more like our classic definitions of disease. Um, and then finally, there are lots of uh, papers in the literature that identify biological markers in autism, um, usually in a subgroup, but those have yet to really translate into something that can guide us in treatment. So when I talk about a potential treatment in quote-unquote autism spectrum disorder, that may be something that fits uh, a pattern like this. Um, people who have fragile X syndrome fit this pattern, for example. Um, and then later in the talk, I'm going to highlight another potential pattern. Um, different pattern of core, core symptoms, different pattern of associated symptoms. And yet when we talk about treatments in quote-unquote autism, um, we're lumping these folks together, um, maybe 100, 150 different patterns and saying that a treatment works across the entire disorder. When we boil things down to the level of risk, um, most of our epidemiology still favors a model that looks something like this, where there are multiple relatively common risk factors. These can be genetic variants. These can be environmental exposures that coincide in an individual in order to lead to risk of autism. Instead of these relatively common risk factors, however, most of what has already been identified in the literature are relatively rare events that by themselves confer much of the risk for an individual. This could include something like fragile X syndrome that I will use as an example today, um, but quite a number of other genetic findings, some of which first emerged by describing a genetic syndrome, some of which first emerged by uh, doing genetic testing within individuals with autism. As these uh, cluster, we also see the emergence of some rare environmental risk factors like exposure to valproic acid, um, which is sometimes used for bipolar disorder or epilepsy uh, during pregnancy, which clearly increases the risk of autism. As these cluster, we can imagine that some of them may coincide with common risk factors that may be present in a larger group of individuals. Thus far, that hasn't been clear across autism spectrum disorder, but within particular subgroups, uh, each of which are relatively uncommon. You'll note that all of these rare variants or syndromes are present in 1% or less of the overall population. The genetics, however, is actually simple in comparison to the brain. Um, so when we think about the impact of gene variants, we have to think about them across development um, because, of course, this is a developmental disorder. And then we also have to think about the cascade leading from genes to encoded proteins, uh, protein networks, cells that can be affected, uh, synapses connecting cells to one another, brain region circuits, information processing, and finally, cognitive and behavioral domains. Of course, as I've told you, we have selected on the basis of a coalescing in symptoms. And so we can expect that near the top of this inverted pyramid, we will see some commonalities. Ideally, some of those lead us, oh goodness, sorry, my apologies. Uh, my uh, PowerPoint seems to have crashed momentarily. I will pull that back up. Um, but near the top of the inverted pyramid, forgive me as I uh, convince this to work again, um, we can expect to see things coalesce again. And where they coalesce, um, potentially we could have a treatment, um, and that uh, treatment would potentially uh, bridge from one subset of individuals that may lead us all the way from genes uh, to cognitive and behavioral domains, but it may also apply across a larger group of people who are affected. By and large, however, what has been identified, at least in the initial studies, are protein networks um, that coalesce 
uh, amongst different genetic findings, but with a significant gap, a black box um, between that and the resulting cognitive or behavioral symptoms. This remains a substantial improvement over our previous pathway to treatment, where almost every um, medicine that we have to use in psychiatry, and frankly, every treatment that we have to use since the psychotherapies use this model as well, have essentially a black box um, where a molecular understanding of the brain could go. Um, we know that these treatments work, um, but we would much rather have a pathway based on neurobiology. Um, I think it's important to note that we also know that in many cases, an increase in activity or dosage of a gene can lead to a developmental risk, as you see here, but you also oftentimes see a decrease leading to a similar developmental risk. And this has been seen time and time again, but if we have a treatment that might lead to improvement in this individual, you can imagine it might actually lead to worsening in this individual, suggesting that we really need an understanding of what's happening in the brain of the individual, as opposed to just treatments for quote unquote autism. So that's a brief overview of heterogeneity. I'm going to very briefly talk about the treatments that we have available in the clinic right now. Um, by and large, most people with autism spectrum disorder should spend most of their time in behavioral interventions, but I have a single slide on this, um, and that's because I'm really focused on biology today. But these behavioral interventions are um, at least those that are best studied early and intensive behavioral and developmental approaches that require 20 plus hours a week and are best uh, studied between the ages of about 18 months and about seven years of age. There are other interventions that are more targeted like treatments for anxiety or treatments for social skills, particularly in those um, who are able to use language easily. On the medication front, it's instructive to note um, which medicine has had the most placebo-controlled trials in autism spectrum disorder, and it actually is not a medicine that is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. In fact, it's not a medicine that is effective in autism at all, and that's Secretin, which about 20 years ago was a fad medicine um, that was initially reported in a case series uh, following a GI procedure where children seemed to have improvements. Um, this was then studied in seven randomized controlled studies, uh, demonstrating that there was no benefit uh, that exceeded the benefit from placebo. And in fact, in these studies, you saw a placebo response rate between 22% and 50%, suggesting that in a developmental disorder, at least if you wait a long enough period of time, um, you will see what look to be improvements, uh, even when somebody is receiving placebo treatment. Some of that may be development, which continues in those with a developmental disorder. Um, some of it may be expectancy uh, and hope, um, and some of it is, is still somewhat un, uh, misunderstood or not understood. All of the evidence-based medicines that we have in autism spectrum disorder do not target core symptoms, but instead uh, treat associated symptoms. So this includes irritability and agitation, where we have the only medicines that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Those are risperidone and aripiprazole. These are medicines um, that really help for kids who have aggression or self-injury. This isn't just grumpiness. That's not what we mean by irritability. And they're medicines that are associated with significant side effects. We also now have significant evidence that medicines help with attention deficit hyperactivity symptoms in autism spectrum disorder. These medicines don't work as well in autism as they work in those without autism who have ADHD, um, but they do help many individuals um, and have similar but uh, greater degree of side effect risk. And that's what we really have evidence for on the medicine side. Those are uh, medicines that have been tested in more than one trial and really seem to show significant benefit. Clearly, we need to do better. So how do we get there? One approach is to think about those rare genetic findings um, that I highlighted on the right-hand side of that slide about autism risk. Um, I'm going to use one of these examples. We could use a number of others, but I'm going to use Fragile X syndrome because the genetics has been worked out uh, for more than two decades at this point, um, and it is possible to understand at least some aspects of neurobiology well enough to uh, hypothesize potential treatments. Fragile X syndrome doesn't always lead to autism spectrum disorder, so you see autism symptoms in many, um, if not all, 
um, but only about 30 to 50 percent, we think, will meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder. They also have other difficulties, including hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, and some clinicians feel like they can pull out people with autism spectrum disorder based, uh, uh, who have fragile X syndrome based on appearance, um, but that's less possible until after puberty. The molecular genetics here is well understood. There is an expanding trinucleotide repeat, the CGG repeat, in the five un prime untranslated region of the gene. That leads to hypermethylation of the gene and silencing. So essentially, you lose the protein product. The protein product, FMRP, is an RNA chaperone that has a number of roles in neurons. And I'm going to highlight one of the one of those. This is known as the mglur 5 receptor hypothesis um, work that was done by Mark Baer, Kim Huber, and others. Uh, really developed this idea. Um, and the idea as represented here is that the presynaptic neuron releases glutamate, which signals at AMPA receptors. You can think of those sort of as the gas of the uh, postsynaptic side, but they also stimulate uh, mglu 5 receptors, which act something like a break. If you have uh, signaling here, it actually removes the AMPA receptors from the recirculating pool um, and serves to dampen further response. And the FMRP protein actually serves as a release on this breaking mechanism so that it prevents excessive breaking uh, and prevents tuning down the synapse excessively. When you're lacking FMRP, as a result, you see synapses that fail to adequately develop um, because they have too much of the break on, essentially. And when that happens, you can actually see it anatomically. Under a microscope, it looks uh, like there are excessive uh, dendritic spines, as if they are reaching out, trying to make connections and unable to form that mature synapse. That looks the same in the mouse model as in the human postmortem tissue. And you see here the fragile X appearance with immature appearing dendritic spines, um, looking more like philopodia, reaching out like antennae, as opposed to the mature appearance in a typical animal or a typical human. So the mouse is a great model from that perspective. Unfortunately, from a behavioral perspective, they have only mild hyperactivity. They have some very subtle um, and inconsistent social deficits and quite subtle um, uh, impairments in learning that don't easily translate to a human, uh, as well as inducible seizures. But in a mouse, you can actually test potential medications in a way that you could never think of testing them in a human. Uh, so in this study, and this is one of the um, uh, conflicts of interest that I highlighted, this was, was work done by Roche, uh, although I was not involved in this work. Um, they administered uh, this potential medicine shortly after weaning in the mouse for four weeks, extending all the way to sexual maturity. Obviously, that's something that's difficult to uh, mirror in a human study, but what they saw is a remarkable rescue of the dendritic spine appearance. They saw improvement in hyperactivity, improvement in learning that, again, does not easily translate to the human, uh, improvement in seizures, and no obvious ill effects on health. Wonderful news, the sort of thing that you'd like to translate. Um, and when we think about our inver inverted pyramid here, we get all the way up to synaptic function. There is still a gap at the level of behavior um, where we don't know exactly what to expect when we translate to humans. So good news, bad news, there have been initial studies in humans. Um, those studies uh, were in uh, adults and adolescents, and this is uh, work funded by Novartis. Again, um, we were part of uh, this work and received funding from Novartis. Um, and unfortunately, what you see here is that the uh, gray line, uh, which represents the placebo, uh, outperformed the active uh, drug line in most conditions. And in no condition was there a significant advantage for active drug over placebo. And that's incredibly disappointing. If you step back and look at the data, however, um, and take a broader perspective, most child psychiatrists, most pediatric neurologists would not suggest that we need to start by testing potential treatments for a developmental disorder in adults or even in adolescents. Most of us would say that you should really focus on those periods of time when learning is most dynamic um, and when the developmental disorder is uh, most actively separating from typical development. There were also questions about outcome measures in these studies, uh, which really focused on aberrant behaviors, abnormal behaviors that can easily be assessed, um, but not on learning, uh, not on uh, social engagement, not on repetitive behavior in a straightforward way, um, and with no outcome measures, easily targeting um, what's actually happening at the level of the brain. Uh, 
Um, and so now as part of a larger network, we're actually focusing at an early period of development in three to six year olds um, and focusing in not just on behavior, but on information processing using eye tracking and on circuitry using a response to auditory stimuli um, in EEG recordings. Um, so this is still, I think, a hopeful pathway um, but I would note that not every one of the ideas that emerges from a mouse model or a cellular model or even a monkey model is going to translate into a new treatment uh, in humans, because obviously what we expect humans to learn and pick up is much more complex than what a mouse needs to learn in a cage. The promise of this approach is first and foremost the potential for profound benefit in a particular syndrome where we really understand the neurobiology. The second potential that I would uh, point to is the oppor opportunity to learn how we actually study such a treatment. We've never really had this. Um, so we don't know what sort of uh, time window we're going to need to target, what age we need to study, what sort of outcome measures are likely to, to reveal a change when we have a treatment based on the neurobiology of a developmental disorder. And finally, I think it's reasonable to hope that some of these sorts of treatments may extend to a larger subset of children with autism who do not share this particular syndrome. Um, we'll come back to biomarkers as one way to potentially tie that together. So the other pathway is almost the exact opposite, which is to think about symptoms that we may be able to target. Um, and this is really where we've had our success in autism spectrum disorder treatment so far. So when I see a child with autism spectrum disorder in the clinic, one of the first things that I ask about is constipation. Why? Not because constipation causes autism or autism symptoms in any particular way, but constipation is clearly more common in some kids with autism, um, at least the large minority. Sometimes in, in some studies, it seems even to the ma majority of, of kids with autism have constipation, and I know that I can treat that. Not that it's based on pathophysiology, but it offers a relief from discomfort. Similarly, if I can identify that a child has epilepsy, that's something that we can definitely treat and definitely will lead to improvements in outcomes. And then things like language and cognition are targeted by behavioral and educational interventions, not specific to a knowledge of neurobiology for sure, but things that really matter. And then as a psychiatrist, when I uh, pull out a medicine, I'm pulling that out for an associated symptom, again, based not on neurobiology, but on symptom targets. And finally, there are uh, symptoms that we sometimes think of as core to autism, like sociability or interest in others, that actually are not required to have an autism diagnosis and may be a major part of the impairment in some kids, but not in others who may actually be very social, um, but engage socially in sometimes inappropriate ways, touching others' faces, having uh, too small a distance between one individual and another. And so if we had a treatment that targeted sociability, I'd be thrilled, but I certainly would not deliver that treatment to every child with autism. These sorts of symptomatic treatments, I would say, may actually benefit a larger group of children with autism spectrum disorder, but they are less likely to lead to a profound change, um, but are more likely to simply lead to improvement in a particular symptom domain. We certainly would not describe them as quote unquote cures, um, although we could have a larger debate about whether that's something that we can expect with any treatment, um, but we also can't even suggest that they are disease modifying. Instead, they're targeting specific symptoms in a way that's likely to act across disorders. When we think about our inverted pyramid, that may look something like this, where we're really targeting something uh, near the top, near the symptoms, um, ideally with some knowledge of circuitry impacting on information processing and, and symptoms. I'm going to use an example here, which is also essentially based on where the knowledge is. Um, not that this is the most hopeful example, but that this is where uh, most of the studies um, have centered. So oxytocin is well known for its roles across species um, in parenting behavior, in social attachment, um, pair bonding, trust. Um, it also has a, uh, a sibling hormone, vasopressin, um, which has some overlapping and some disparate effects that uh, also have come under study. 
Um, but in autism spectrum disorder, uh, we find that there are really not consistent data pointing to uh, oxytocin as involved in pathophysiology. Um, there are some scattered data that I'd be happy to take questions on after, um, but it certainly is not convincing that some deficit in the oxytocin system accounts for symptoms in autism spectrum disorder. But we know from studies both in the typical population, and this is an example in autism spectrum disorder, that oxytocin can impact social function. And what you see here is a study out of France uh, where this individual here, the participant in the study, could either throw a cyber ball, a pretend ball, to an individual who returns the ball, an individual who throws it willy-nilly, or an individual who never returns the ball. And you see in a typical population that there's a significant bias toward the individual who throws the ball back. And you see in an autism population that received a, a, a nasal spray of uh, placebo, there is no such preference, whereas those who received a nasal spray of oxytocin showed a significant preference for the individual who throws the ball back. Now, throwing a cyber ball certainly is not a symptom uh, of autism spectrum disorder, and this laboratory test certainly is not conclusive that this is a potential treatment. But it's important to note that in a study out of a, a group at Yale, uh, led by Kevin Pelfrey, um, intranasal oxytocin can also change brain activation patterns. And here you see a, a change in activation in response to either uh, viewing a social stimulus or eyes versus viewing vehicles in the oxytocin compared to the placebo condition, including brain regions that we think are important for social function, as well as reward regions like the nucleus accumbens. Now, it's important to note that in this particular study, there was not a behavioral change that was noted, um, which in some ways is a good control, but also suggests that oxytocin doesn't always move behavioral function, even in the laboratory. And then this is a pilot study out of a group at Stanford, led by Karen Parker, where they administered either intranasal oxytocin or placebo uh, across four weeks and found that when they controlled for a baseline level of oxytocin, they saw a significant benefit for oxytocin treatment. I think with these pilot studies, it's important both to be hopeful and recognize that this is the sort of thing that's worthy of further study, um, but also be hesitant and that uh, baseline oxytocin levels were not necessarily part of the hypothesis going into the study. Um, what's next here really is uh, taking this into the real world with extended treatment, um, looking at uh, chronic administration, allowing adjustment in doses, um, and then looking at social function in real world settings, uh, potentially integrating baseline oxytocin levels since this is something um, that showed some promise. Uh, we now have data from such a trial that's just now entering analysis led by Lynn Sikic at Duke, uh, as well as a number of sites, including ours. So those are the two pathways. Um, I would note that it's important for us to not, while we're thinking about these pathways, forget that autism is not a single disease, um, and think about how we may be able to split the difference between these rare risk variants that affect 1% or less, um, and these treatments that may uh, affect a larger group, but may uh, target a particular symptom. And so I'm going to show some data that are an example of the potential situation where treatment benefits more than 1%, um, but certainly less than the majority. And again, here, um, I would highlight the disclosure, Seaside Therapeutics, which funded this work, although um, is no longer in business in part as a result of um, the data I'm about to show. Um, so this study of Arbaclifen, which is a GABA B agonist, and I, I don't want to focus so much on the mechanism here. I really want to focus conceptually at how these data look. Um, the target in the study was social withdrawal measured with a parent checklist, but there were a number of secondary measures, including a clinician rating of either improvement or severity levels across the trial. When you look at that primary outcome measure, just to convince you, there really is no separation in terms of change from baseline across the study. But if we zoom in on that clinician global impression of severity across the study, you see that there is a separation that occurs over time. Um, and when we look at 
the individuals who are showing changes, we see that most of the difference is present either in the group that's not changing, meaning more individuals on placebo are showing no change across the study than individuals who are taking the active medicine. And then if you look at individuals who are seeing a substantial change, a two point, three point, or even four point, which we would think of as extremely uncommon, uh, change across the study, that's what's driving the difference with an advantage for the active medicine group. Now, I think it's important to note that these sorts of data, like the oxytocin data, represent a post hoc analysis, meaning it wasn't the plan going into the study, and you have to be very careful not to overinterpret such data. Uh, we can say that this is probably not a general treatment for autism. Certainly, it was the minority of individuals who seemed to show an improvement, around 15% of the total. Um, and we really need a way to identify who responds in such a study. Um, this could include a clinical profile, and there was some evidence in this study, I could direct you to the paper, uh, that individuals with higher IQ or better language seem to improve. Um, and then ideally, some sort of biomarker. Um, and there is some ongoing work looking at that. I would note that uh, this uh, potential medicine is now uh, launching in trials uh, funded in uh, the European Union, as well as the trial funded in Canada. Um, with the hope that we will better understand whether this is a potential treatment in a subgroup of individuals. When we think about a biomarker that may be able to split uh, aspects of autism spectrum disorder, we clearly need it to be readily quantifiable, to be measured reliably, to be rec replicable. Um, it would be nice if it was genetic. I don't know that that's necessary. If there's a clear splitter, it's bimodal, that would be ideal. Um, if it changes with treatment, that may give us an early index of uh, target engagement, uh, predicting that we may see a, a change in symptoms over time. And it would be nice if it ties with pathophysiology, but I would say that really the clear thing that we need is to be able to fill this gap between our symptomatic treatments and our precision medicine so that we're able to identify a subgroup here um, where a larger percentage of people may benefit with a larger impact of treatment exactly where a biomarker would fit um, is unclear until we have an example of something like this. There are some promising biomarkers in autism. Uh, one on the genetic front would be genes that are bound by FMRP and disrupted in an individual with autism spectrum disorder. You'll recall that inverted U-shaped curve um, earlier, or sorry, that U-shaped curve, I guess it's not inverted. Um, we would have to be careful that the effect in the individual with a disruption in a, in a bound gene would be going in the expected direction in order to see benefit from treatment. We could also imagine more direct measures of what's happening in autism. We think that's happening in the brain. Um, you could measure that by uh, MRI, although it's difficult to get most individuals with autism in a scanner. You could also measure it with something like EEG, which is more tractable in this population. There are some other biomarkers like generalized over Growth in a subgroup, immune markers in subgroup, in subgroups, as well as maternal biomarkers. And I'm going to give you an example of an emerging story uh, that fits into this last category. And again, I'm picking not necessarily the biomarker um, that is going to work or pay off. I'm picking a biomarker that is very well studied to show you an example of how we may be able to harness biomarkers or study them in this population. So elevated blood serotonin levels um, were first described in autism in 1961 by my great grand mentor, actually, Daniel X. Friedman. Um, and in uh, some populations, particularly populations that are more homogeneous, you can see that there is a group of people with autism who have serotonin levels in the normal range shown in white here. And then there seems to be a second peak um, with elevated blood serotonin levels that accounts for maybe 25 to 30 percent of children with autism spectrum disorder. This serotonin in the blood does not cross into the brain. The brain. Um, it's contained almost entirely in platelets, these uh, uh, sacs that function within the blood to regulate clotting and vasodilation, vasoconstriction. Um, the serotonin system in the, in the platelet is much simpler than the serotonin system in the brain. Serotonin gets into the platelet via the serotonin transporter, can be packaged and released, also can stimulate receptors uh, on the platelet. We know that blood serotonin levels as a biomarker are more heritable than autism, and that's one of the things that we can imagine uh, could be used to judge a biomarker. In fact, blood serotonin levels are as heritable as height. 
We also know that in autism spectrum disorder, there are linkage signals, so areas of sharing uh, across family members who uh, are affected with autism um, that are higher than you would expect by chance, particularly in families with uh, two or more boys with autism spectrum disorder with no signal in uh, families with uh, one or more affected females. So this linkage signal, area of increased sharing of a chromosomal region, overlies the serotonin transporter. And that serotonin transporter, as I noted, is what accounts for uh, uh, serotonin getting taken up into the platelet. Uh, when you look under that uh, linkage signal in uh, those families that contributed uh, to the evidence of increased sharing, um, you see an increased rate of amino acid variants. Um, this is work from the Blakely and Sutcliffe labs at Vanderbilt, um, where you see that these amino acid variants lead to increased function of the serotonin transporter, which you would expect could potentially lead to an increased level of serotonin in the platelet. The most common of these variants, the uh, alanine 56 variant, is a relatively simple change in the protein um, that you can look at because it is common enough, uh, about 2% in the autism population that was studied. Um, and you can see that it's over-transmitted to affected males, but not females, and associated with rigid compulsive symptoms and sensory aversion. I think it's important to note that some of those uh, rare variants that I pointed to earlier that are really de novo variants much of the time, meaning that they're new mutations in the child, um, do not overlap with changes in the serotonin transporter. And really the best evidence here is linkage evidence, which is more of a, an old fashioned approach than some of the things that are being studied currently. I'd also note that these variants are present in unaffected family members, particularly unaffected girls. And most commonly these variants seem to be passed on from an unaffected mom to an affected boy. So these sorts of amino acid variants um, allow us to move our studies uh, from uh, genetics in humans into animal models. And we did just that with the most common of these variants, that ALA56 or alanine 56 variant. We placed this into the mouse genome. We can see that the mouse uh, grows normally, appears to reproduce normally, and recapitulates this biomarker with elevated blood serotonin levels compared to its wild type litter mates or typical litter mates. Um, we did a number of other studies looking at behavior in these animals, but I'm gonna tell you about sort of an evolving understanding of this biomarker that came more or less by chance um, from studies that we conducted to understand how this variant could impact sensory development. So the serotonin transporter, as I told you, is expressed in the platelet. It's also expressed in neurons that produce and release serotonin. And during development, surprisingly, it's expressed in a number of brain regions that are important for sensory function. And I'm gonna go fairly quickly through this portion because this is really conceptually important as background, um, but not where the findings ended up leading us. So we were hypothesizing that a change in serotonin signaling during development would lead to a change in development of sensory related brain structures that could potentially explain the association with sensory aversion. In particular, we were focused on the tactile system. And in mice, that's something that you can study uh, with exquisite anatomical detail. Uh, you can see here actually a rendering uh, that if you were able to map it onto the mouse's face, would represent the mouse's whisker pad, um, which mice use to explore. Obviously that doesn't translate directly to a human, but it's something that can be visualized beautifully in a mouse. We actually, for the initial studies, looked first at that uh, whisker uh, cortex, um, and then we looked earlier in development to understand whether there was a change during the time period when uh, those projections uh, to the, the whisker cortex were developing. Um, and when we did these studies, uh, the graduate student working on the proposal initially started uh, with these sorts of breedings, whether where a heterozygous dam, mouse mother, um, is uh, carrying both uh, wild type or typical mice as well as mutant mice. And then we make a comparison between the two. And then because he wanted to get more uh, samples for analysis, he did a few experiments where he compared wild type dams to, wild, uh, to mutant dams carrying either wild type or mutant offspring. And what he saw initially was quite exciting, which was a change in the trajectories from the thalamus, which is receiving the sensory input into the cortex during a critical period of development. That change appeared to be a broadening of these projections. 
Um, and he was really excited about it, but it seemed sort of inconsistent from one experiment to the next. And so then he went back and he did more of these experiments the right way, which is to look in the heterozygous dance and didn't see much of an effect. And then rather than stopping and giving up, uh, he looked in a larger sample where uh, the difference is really driven by the maternal genotype, not the offspring genotype. And what he found was, in fact, the maternal genotype seemed to uh, drive this difference in these trajectories, specifically in the brain region that is sensitive to serotonin during development and not in the brain region that shows little expression of the serotonin receptors that seem to mediate this change. And I realize I'm going quickly through that. I'm going quickly through it to get to the point, which is that Surprisingly, it seems to be the maternal system that is driving a difference here. And here I'm going to back up slightly to tell you that during development of the brain, the serotonin neurons uh, arising in the midbrain take some time to project into the cortex. And because of that, there is a period of time during cortical development where the serotonin that's bathing the cortex is actually derived from the placenta, not from the embryo serotonin system itself. And it's during that period of time we think this difference is emerging. And in fact, what we observed is that the serotonin levels in the developing forebrain, that uh, developing cortex, are different between wild-type dams and mutant dams, um, but not when you see uh, the offspring genotype uh, driving the difference um, and no difference in the genotype of the dam. And you see the same thing at the level of the placenta suggesting that it actually is the maternal genotype that is driving this difference in neurodevelopment. And I'm going to pivot from more studies uh, looking at mechanism in mouse to what I usually think of in, uh, in research focusing on human conditions, which is, this is interesting in a mouse, but is it even relevant to a human? Um, we could take such an approach with genetics, but this particular variant is quite rare. Um, instead, we thought, well, let's look at the biological marker that was what got us started down this pathway in the first place. So we hypothesized that this maternal biomarker may actually show associations with phenotype in the offspring, with outcome in the offspring, uh, that are clearer, perhaps, than the relationship between the biomarker and the outcome in the child. So this is the study design, and this was a group of uh, participants originally collected at the University of Illinois at Chicago by Ed Cook and colleagues, where you see in every child uh, an autism diagnosis, and then two parents, a mother and a father, with the hypothesis that um, because we know serotonin levels are, uh, are heritable, that the father's serotonin level is a reasonable control for the mother's serotonin level. Obviously, the father's serotonin level during pregnancy has no impact on the developing brain uh, of the offspring with autism. So we figured we could correct for any significant proband effects by looking at correlations between the proband's uh, serotonin level and outcomes. And then we could look at the maternal and paternal uh, 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 correlations um, to understand whether there is a true relationship with the maternal serotonin system and offspring outcome. We chose observational measures. Um, and in our initial look, we saw no effect of the offspring serotonin level on the phenotype within autism. Now recall that this is a biomarker in autism, but it doesn't uh, predict a particular symptom pattern. And then when we started to look at maternal serotonin levels, we saw initial relationships with uh, measures of social function, repetitive behavior, vocabulary, adaptive behavior, and then it starts to get a little spooky. We see all of these relationships on one side, no relationship on the paternal side. Um, and because our initial analysis was exploratory, we wanted to pivot and take a different approach. And that approach was to do a latent class analysis where we're letting data in clear, discrete domains sort the group of individuals with autism into subgroups. And the subgroups that we found are really driven by severity level, um, with one class being the mildest, a class two being intermediate, and class three being more severe. Um, you can see here that the separation, depending on different symptoms, uh, varies so that uh, you see a big, bigger difference between class three and class two when you look at uh, repetitive behavior um, and nonverbal IQ. And in other places, you see that class three and class two are closer together, particularly when, when you're looking at social behavior over time. 
What we found was quite striking, which was that the most severely affected group actually uh, showed a dramatic association with a lower level of blood serotonin levels um, in the mothers. No relationship uh, with father's serotonin levels, no relationship with offspring serotonin levels. Now, more work is necessary to understand this finding. So it could be that these two groups have an influence of blood serotonin levels in the mother um, during pregnancy. It may be that blood serotonin levels are simply some uh, a metric of something else that's happening in the maternal serotonin system. Um, it could be that this is actually the risk group. We need more in order to understand this better. Um, that includes on the mouse side to understand mechanism, and on the human side, first to replicate this finding, and then to look at this prospectively in a group of individuals not selected for their autism diagnosis. And there was a reason the study happened that in that population. That's where we know that this biomarker is relevant. Um, but we'd really like to understand whether this sort of effect is specific to autism or whether it's something seen in the general population. Ideally, we'd like to look at the biomarker during pregnancy or at the time of birth and then follow it up over time. There is some emerging work uh, pointing to the serotonin system's role in social function across species, including um, uh, work showing that other manipulations uh, of the maternal system during development seem to impact development of the serotonin system itself in the embryo, and then work showing that uh, the function of the serotonin system actually impacts on sociability, at least in animals that have an intact oxytocin system, that there are interactions between these systems. Um, and this suggests that these sorts of findings could be meaningful across species. We're not quite ready to ask these questions, but really importantly, when we are, we need to focus on the sort of intervention that is likely to have an impact but importantly, also when to intervene and what subgroup might respond. I would say if we have a targeted treatment look uh, that's based on these findings in the serotonin system, in particular, we would want to look at the mother's serotonin levels as well as the offspring serotonin levels. And then as I noted at the beginning, we aren't just going to have a potential medicine that by itself is going to be a quote unquote cure or is going to resolve autism. What we can expect instead is a medicine that may put the brain in a better uh, position to benefit from behavioral treatment. There aren't very many examples uh, in autism to date of even attempts to put medication and behavioral treatments together in a single study. This is the one example that had a significant finding. And you'll see here, actually, both groups are taking risperidone, which I told you earlier helps with uh, disruptive behaviors, irritability, and agitation. Um, and you can see that both groups receiving risperidone see significant improvement, but a group that is receiving an add-on behavioral treatment uh, delivered via the parents shows more improvement over time. And what's not shown here is they also ended up on a lower dose of risperidone. I would say that there's some question about whether this sort of difference is clinically significant, but I can tell you in the clinic that we would be glad to see such a difference. I think what we can hope for is even a more substantial change. And this is an example from the anxiety disorders literature as well as the OCD literature, um, where now there are multiple studies pointing to a medicine, D-cycloserine, which is an NMDA receptor partial agonist, although the mechanism here is less important than the concept, where if you give this medicine um, one to two hours before psychotherapy, you can see a more rapid improvement in the group receiving the medicine versus the placebo group um, that would potentially allow a greater benefit from behavioral treatment. And as I told you at the beginning, our behavioral treatments are 20 to 40 hours of treatment, early intensive behavioral intervention across years for kids with autism spectrum disorder. If we had a medicine that potentiated response during that treatment, that could be incredibly powerful and would substantially increase the number of children who could access such an impactful treatment. So briefly, this is my overview. Importantly, to return to the beginning, autism is not a disease, certainly not a single disease. Our current treatments are not based on neurobiology. They can be efficacious, but usually for associated symptoms. Um, placebo effects occur. I think we have prom promising pathways forward, but we are going to need thoughtful approaches to identify subgroups that are likely to benefit. 
want to thank a number of people that were involved in this work, um, both at my t during my time at Vanderbilt as well as during my time here at Columbia. Um, folks involved on the molecular side, including the graduate student who had that critical insight, instead of viewing his work as a mistake, um, he viewed it as a chance finding that actually led us in an unexpected and new direction. And finally, again, funders, including the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Be happy to take some time for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for an excellent presentation on a complicated topic. Um, and you, you did a great job uh, explaining it to not only scientists, but to a, to a lay audience. Oh, thank you, Jeff. And, yeah, um, thank you. And I guess one of the real challenges is how does this research affect people who may have recently been diagnosed with autism? What what hope can family members look towards in terms of the um, the lives of their loved one? Sure, absolutely. So I think that there's the near term, the medium term, and the long term. So the the near term, um, if your child has recently been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, where you get started, where you always get started, is with that early intensive behavioral intervention. So you want to get an evaluation from somebody who really pay, pays attention to your child um, as opposed to applying a treatment simply based on a diagnosis. Um, and then you want to get the right dose and you want to make sure that your child is really engaged with the provider. Um, and so that sort of early intensive behavioral intervention sometimes happens in the school setting, sometimes happens in the medical setting, varies substantially from state to state. But the important thing is to get an evaluation from somebody who can offer you those sorts of recommendations. In the medium term, um, it is very important to establish a medical home sort of relationship with somebody who pays attention to those things happening around the edges of that figure. So is your child dealing with constipation? Is epilepsy an issue? Uh, is your child dealing with a, a particular language difficulty that can be treated with speech therapy? Is your child struggling with hyperactivity? We know that for kids who have autism and severe hyperactivity, if we treat the hyperactivity, we see dramatic improvements in their ability to learn in a classroom, and that can lead to a quite different trajectory over time. So somebody who's really paying attention to the whole child, establishing and maintaining that relationship so that you're able to have guidance uh, over time. Um, and we really think about that in terms of touch points. So, um, you know, risperidone or aripiprazole may be something that's necessary when a child is 12 or 13. It may be that their hyperactivity gets treated at a younger age. It may be that we think about a different uh, social skills type of intervention when they're a teen and dealing with the pressures of uh, coexisting in a lunchroom with other kids um, at a lunch table. Um, in the longer term, and this is this is harder to predict, um, but we currently recommend that every child with autism spectrum disorder receive genetic testing. So why do we recommend that? Right now, we don't yet have treatments that are clearly based on a genetic finding in autism. We do have cases, however, where we do the genetic testing and you know, roughly 10 to 20 percent of the time, depending on how much testing you do, you will find something. And, and you'll find something without which that child almost certainly would not have autism spectrum disorder. So sometimes that leads you to a medical condition that you wouldn't have tested for otherwise. So for example, some of those rare genetic conditions uh, are associated with epilepsy during the teen years, something that frequently is missed until it becomes more severe. You can catch it early, you can treat it. Um, those genetic findings also guide us in terms of prognosis. They help families to find communities that are dealing with similar difficulties. It's incredibly powerful to have a genetic diagnosis and then connect with families that have had the same experience that you've had to see what your child's condition is likely to look like when they are 20, 25, 45, um, and understand uh, the sort of life, the sort of supports or not um, that your child is likely to need over time. So that is something that is powerful. And then over the course of um, your child's life, those genetic findings, at least some of them, are quite likely to translate uh, into new treatments, and we don't know yet the degree to which those new treatments will be transformative in a particular disorder, but we would expect that they would ameliorate symptoms. Very, very good overview, um, looking at different 
you know, long term, short term. What what should families be thinking about if they have a child who has autism and are thinking about having another child? What are the types of issues that families should be thinking about in those circumstances? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think families uh, approach this very differently. So I think the the first piece is to think uh, as a family, and sometimes it's helpful to talk with a physician or a counselor um, about the risk um, versus the hope for the next child. Uh, we know from uh, family studies that the risk of having a subsequent child immediately after a child with autism spectrum disorder hovers around 20%. Um, in some studies, a little lower. Um, in more recent studies, it's around 17 to 20%. Some families hear that and think, well, there's an 80% chance that my next child will not have autism spectrum disorder. Some families hear it the other way. And that's where it's really important to contemplate. The genetic testing that we can currently do can shape expectations. So if you find one of those rare genetic conditions that leads to risk of autism, um, which again is found about 20% of kids, you can then uh, calculate more accurately the risk for the next child. So it may be that you find something new in the child that's not found in either parent, in which case you can do uh, advanced testing sometimes to do surveillance in sperm um, to verify that it's not present in other sperm. But most of the time, we make the assumption that it's quite unlikely that something that is new, that's a new mutation in the child and not present in any parent, in either parent, will recur, as opposed to something that's inherited. And then we can make a calculation if it's inherited, say, from mom, that then roughly 50% of the time, if it's something that is inherited as a single variant, it will be present in the next child. Um, it is possible to do pre-implantation testing and other things, but this is really something to talk about um, with an obstetrician who's making these sorts of decisions on a regular basis. So it really is something to get more information from someone who has expertise in this area that can give guidance, and obviously each family needs to have this information and make the best decision that they can for their own family. Absolutely. And I think it's important to note that in no case does the genetic variant predict autism 100% of the time. Um, and so it, it occurs on a particular genetic background. It is never uh, perfect uh, in terms of making a prediction based on a genetic finding about whether the next child will have autism or not. I want you to say a few words about where the current science is on what's received a lot of publicity about immunization and autism. Could you tell us sure. what the state of science is on that important issue? And this is a simple one. Um, and this is one of these situations where we as scientists oftentimes don't speak clearly enough um, and sometimes get drowned out by people in the popular media. Vaccines do not contribute to risk of autism. In fact, one of the few things we can point to as preventing autism spectrum disorder is a vaccine. Um, so it turns out that exposure to rubella or German measles during the early uh, uh, pregnancy time window, not particularly nailed, perfectly nailed down, but seems like end of first trimester, beginning of second trimester, can substantially increase risk of autism as well as sensory and other uh, developmental difficulties. We prevent that uh, by using the MMR vaccine. And it's one of the things that gets tested for in prenatal testing. So in fact, vaccines prevent autism, um, although vaccines given to the mother prevent autism. And there's no credible evidence whatsoever that vaccines contribute to autism. There are kids who have difficulty with vaccines. Oftentimes those kids have metabolic problems. Those are not children who simply have autism spectrum disorder. Um, and those are children who would decompensate the first time they became ill, not necessarily just with a, a vaccine, which actually would prevent a more severe illness. The, we have time for one more question, and that I'm going to ask for just a, 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 your guidance. If a family, if a parent is concerned about their child, they just don't know if, if they're developing in a way that would be typical, what should they do? 
So usually the first step is to talk with somebody who already is part of their circle, which is the pediatrician. Um, most pediatricians get asked this question frequently. Um, not every pediatrician is expert in assessing whether a child needs to be referred for further evaluation. And so you want to talk with the pediatrician. You want to be sure that the pediatrician is taking you seriously and is doing something, asking questions, interacting with the child that shows that they're taking the concern seriously and assessing whether the child needs further evaluation. Most pediatricians will do that really nicely. If you feel as if the evaluation is not adequate, um, then it's important to pursue either an assessment by a developmental pediatrician or a developmental psychologist for further evaluation. Importantly, families spend more time with their kids than anyone else does. And so if you have a concern, I think it's important to take your concern seriously and talk with somebody who's more expert and seek out somebody more expert still if you feel like your concerns are not being taken seriously. Excellent guidance once again. Um, Jeremy, I want to thank you for taking the time to make this presentation and for the work that you're doing, which really does offer tremendous hope for um, people living with autism, for families of people with autism. Uh, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, I also want Thanks. I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations, so please consider making a contribution by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of this presentation or would like to share it with a family member or friend, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. Finally, I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Jeffrey Meyer, head of the Neurochemical Imaging Program in Mood and Anxiety Disorders at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, Canada, will present Neuroimaging Inflammation in Clinical Depression and Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, December 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.